Magic is afoot inside a run-of-the-mill warehouse in an industrial precinct on the outskirts of Cairns. OK, so it's not magic, it's science. But like a lot of science, it seems astounding. This is Rainstick, a biotech startup. They're using a unique blend of traditional indigenous knowledge and modern science to optimise plant and fungi growth. Daryl Lyons is the chief rainmaker. Yeah, so chief rainmaker sounds like a really cool title, but um, I guess <laughs> out to do everything in business development, creating a company, lots of different hats in the early stage of a startup. Um, but really around strategy and how we can scale this technology globally to make a difference in agriculture. So what is Rainstick? What's your aim? Aim is to come up with a new profitable solution that's sustainable for producers because we've got to have a serious transition in ag to help producers with the current climate variation that they're experiencing today. Sounds good, but what does it actually mean? About three years ago, in his home garage, Mike Black, the chief thunderstorm creator, was thinking about the link between external electric fields, like lightning, and what could potentially happen when it intersects with biology. We take seeds and we apply an electric field similar to what happens during a thunderstorm. And that's a specially tuned electric field that happens to the seeds, and then those seeds get shipped out to the producer for them to grow. So it's a very frictionless experience for the producer because they don't have to change any on-farm processes because we've altered the seeds here. The thing with cutting-edge technology like this is it's all very top secret and the team are fiercely protective of their intellectual property. So they won't let us show you what happens behind the big black door with a lightning bolt on it. So let's talk about that knowledge and the processes. What are the processes that you are using? Because I know behind that door, um, we're not allowed to go there. So When you <laughs> do have thunderstorms come over, it creates electric fields in the air. And in those fields, you have frequencies. And at a cell level, including us and everything that's living biology, is an electrical single. And those frequencies can change certain reactions and effect. So I guess we've set out on a very big task with no science, nothing there to try and map how these frequencies have a very targeted effect to grow either more roots or more shoots in plants. It's not just about zapping seeds with electricity. These scientists are fine-tuning frequencies, waveforms and timing to unlock better crop performance, one carefully measured step at a time. We work with a couple of basic elements to our formula. We have our frequency, a waveform and the duration of that treatment. And there can be 50,000 different frequencies, any way you can draw a squiggly line and any duration. So you can't brute force something like this. For, for us, it's a matter of getting the early indications and taking it methodically through each of the steps so that we have the desired effect we want without the effect we don't want. Photosystem one then acts to also uh, re-energize the electron for it to be passed off to ferrodoxin and NAD plus reductase. Mike says it's not genetic modification and it's not chemical. This new seed treatment uses bioelectrical signals to influence how genes express themselves without altering the DNA. Their goal is to give seedlings a stronger start that could last their entire growth cycle. But with so much still unknown, real-world trials are crucial to understanding how it performs beyond the lab. And one thing you absolutely can't ignore is the anecdotal feedback from the farmers themselves. And it can be something that you don't expect. For example, we had a, a leafy greens farmer say, we noticed that the caterpillars didn't eat this particular one. And we're like, well, that's really curious because we didn't tell them which one was treated and which one was control. And, and we were pretty happy to know that it was the treated one. Eureka! But does it work in the paddocks? To... Pip Grant is the CEO of Riverine Plains, a farming systems group operating from southern New South Wales to northeast Victoria. With over 450 farmer members running largely mixed enterprises, they've been working with Rainstick since 2023. We're really working with the Rainstick team on the Broadacre. How do we actually translate this technology from mushrooms, um, pak choy, um, our indoor sort of crops, 
what does that look like once we bring it out into broadacre crops where you know we could be um, sowing thousands of hectares at any given runs. moment rather than um, smaller hectares or trays in, in an indoor yeah. cropping setting. Pip says growers are losing money due to low crop establishment rates, even after investing in high-end seeds. Work from CSIRO and the Grains Research and Development Corporation has estimated it's over $100 million lost to the cropping industry in Australia just on the canola establishment rates alone. By improving those rates with seed treatments like rain sticks technology, there's a chance to boost productivity. Pip and her team co-designed the trial protocol with Rainstick's bioelectrical team, engineers and company founders. Rainstick treated the seeds in cans, which were sent to Riverine Plains, and 48 plots were sown to look at different stages of growth right through the yield. The key challenges that poor establishment is presenting to Australian farmers at the moment is one, wasted money. So hundreds of dollars a hectare could be wasted in poor establishment rates, which then impacts in yield. So the whole productivity per hectare is going to be a lot lower. So you've got the untreated sample here and the treated here, and you can see that there's a lot of difference in the root biomass on each of the plants. And so These plants are being watched and measured. So eventually we will harvest these plots and do all the stats on them, but at the moment it's a visual assessment in terms of are the tap roots looking like they're bigger. In the early stages of that two to four week establishment period, was there a lot more vigour in the root growth? And so it has actually been quite wild to see the difference in some of the treated canola plants versus the control canola plants and actually just visually comparing them. But of course we want to see what that actually means in terms of coming through to yield. Daryl and Mike aren't just working with farmers to prove their theory. They've also teamed up with scientists from the University of Queensland and James Cook University in Cairns. Dr Use Yordi Nailis, is a researcher at JCU. Among other things, he develops new technologies that can detect food and environmental contaminants to create a more sustainable future. He's been working with Rainstick on these tomato plants. Jody talks a lot of science that I've tried to follow. So what I've seen so far, what we try to do here is to look at a bunch of different molecules. So we try to look at all the small molecules in there and also all the lipids. And then um, we plot them to metabolomic networks to try and have an idea if there's any changes in the metabolic mechanisms of the plant. And basically what we found is that there seems to be really quite some differences. Different metabolic pathways are activated. Good differences? Yes. So uh, one of the things we've observed so far is that there's really an increase in leaf mass after the treatment. We also look at the stable isotopes and, and the amount of carbon and hydrogen present in the plants, and we found differences there as well. After getting his hands dirty, Jordi takes the results to the computer to measure the isotope values of the carbon and nitrogen in the plants. Just so you know, isotopes are atoms of the same chemical element that have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. Stay with me. So by measuring those changes in isotopes and comparing them between the control and treated, I can uh, have some indications of what kind of metabolic pathways are uh, initiated with the treatment uh, and of course also just looking at nitrogen and carbon percentages in the tissue tells you if it has taken up more nitrogen or not, if it's growing faster, if it's more uh, energy efficient. Which is good news for farmers. It's not just crops the Rainstick team are interested in. Darrell believes their technology can help with reforestation projects as well. It's hugely important. I think it's a massive opportunity for Australia. We've got to reforest mines, we've got to reforest areas globally to help with climate variation. And I think what I'm also passionate about is how do we assist farmers in getting some native belts in their properties to help them transition to more sustainable production. Which natives are we looking at here? So here we've got a Grevillea, so which is in the Pilbara. Very poor establishment, iconic species that they want there. It's got a lot of relevance to the traditional owners. And up here, similar, this is for probably up in northern Australia in the Darwin Stringy Bar. Again, got a lot of relevance for a lot of the TOs across the Cape York and also across all of northern Australia. And they both have a big establishment issue. So some of the early results show we're moving the dial. So yeah, we've got more work to do. 
While unexpected field results on all projects are catching Rainstick's attention, it's the collaboration with farmers that's helping shape the bigger picture. Testing what works, where it works best, and whether it makes financial sense on the ground. We're really early stage at the moment um, with working with the Rainstick team, so we still need to work out how effective it is, where it's most effective, and then we'll be working out, OK, what's the price points on there? But that's um, the beauty of working with these companies really early, is that we can work out, OK, well, what does that actually need to look like for a farm business to actually receive the return on investment for them to invest in the technology in the first place? And that's definitely what we're looking to achieve. This biotechnology isn't just about transforming agriculture and reforestation. It's also deeply personal for Daryl Lyons, whose work is driven by a powerful connection to his ancestral heritage. Unfortunately, my great-grandmother was probably the only survivor from the Marawali people. Um, where our area is massive, and probably about 70 million hectares. So yeah, we didn't have that handed down tradition but I've kind of been lucky over the last 15 years to go back out in country and then connect to that heritage and very passionate about how I think traditional knowledge can have a huge effect globally by bringing that knowledge to create new bits of science to help us transition.